hearts going down. Appreciate the choir and uh, their diligence to work and to uh, prepare. And uh, Romans chapter nine this morning. We spent three weeks in Romans eight. Great chapter in the Word of God. Romans nine enters into kind of a different frame of mind, and I, it may at first seem to be uh, something that seems to be not too pleasant to talk about, which is the unbelief in Israel. But as we begin to see some things here that the Apostle Paul, you begin to see the Apostle Paul's heart for Israel, but also he outlines some things about uh, 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 how that God has dealt with Israel as a nation uh, throughout the years, what they had as a heritage, and uh, uh, you begin to see some things of how God works in uh, individuals as well as in nations, groups of people, and uh, there's a lot of good implications. And so uh, we'll just read these first five verses because that's as far as we'll get this morning. There's a lot of content in these verses for us to uh, look at this morning. In Romans chapter 9, starting at verse 1, Here's the words of the Apostle Paul as he first starts out with an oath. He says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren or my countrymen according to the flesh who are, all, uh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, <laughs> of whom are the fathers uh, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. And so uh, here's a great passage of scripture that <laughs> describes for us the Apostle Paul's heart for Israel. Let us pray. Dear Father, we're asking, Lord, that you would give us the same heart uh, that Paul had for Israel, uh, that we might have the same heart for America this morning. As we uh, celebrated July the 4th last weekend, and, and uh, the birth and, and the founding of our, our freedom, and God, we ask your blessings upon us this morning as we, uh, Lord, uh, 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 examine our own hearts as to where we are with you. And Lord will give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. So it, he approaches the problem of the Jewish unbelief. And you might say, well, that doesn't apply to us. We're in the church. We're in the grace of God. And, and uh, we, we're the Gentiles. And we believed in Christ. And so uh, these uh, chapters, in fact, chapters 9, 10, and 11, are going to deal with this whole uh, situation. And you say, well, I'd say, well, that's kind of parenthetical. It's, it's not dealing with us, and so I'm, I'm not going to pay that close attention to it. But uh, it, it, it helps us to understand a lot, not only about the heart of the Apostle Paul, uh, it helps us to understand about how that God deals uh, with different people. Now, it's been intriguing to many Bible students and scholars about uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, because... It's coming right off of, of Paul talking about uh, the, the greatness of salvation, how that it comes about, uh, how that the, the blessings and the applications of all this great salvation as we read in chapter 8, uh, the wonderful uh, 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 blessings that come as a result of being saved by the grace of God. So notice how that uh, uh, you might ask the question, well, how could they possibly reject of the Lord Jesus as their Messiah and as their Savior. Well, and just in the same way that people uh, see the goodness of God today and still uh, reject Him. You think, uh, how is that even possible? When you uh, come, uh, how do you approach uh, the, the uh, trials of life and the problems that we face without having the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? And on this side, we look back on that and say, how is that even possible for a person to reject Christ? But on the other side, you realize that uh, people are blinded by Satan. Uh, people are, are, are steeped in their own religions. 
Uh, they're they're uh, uh, trusting in their own good works. They're trusting in uh, somehow that somehow they're going to uh, uh, approach uh, God and their good will outweigh their bad and somehow they'll, they'll make it to heaven, you know, by their uh, goodness. But uh, uh, that, of course, is not the uh, biblical answer. That, is, of course, is not the reason why Christ died. He died for our sins. And if, uh, if we can make it on our good works, then he died in vain. And so uh, the, we find that uh, as the Apostle Paul uh, talks about his uh, fellow countrymen, and uh, the, we, we see his anguish in verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> he was excited about the thought of God's love, God's salvation. But uh, uh, then as he uh, comes to this understanding, and, and he was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he's talking about his own people, Israel, in, in these uh, times. And so uh, we find that a cloud passes over his rejoicing as he contemplated Israel's rejection of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Notice the apostle begins his new section of chapters 9 through 11 with a solemn oath in chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now we might uh, look at this and say, why is this even necessary? You have to understand there's several things about oath uh, that are important in the Bible. And that is, first of all, it was very common in those days uh, to make an oath. When you were uh, speaking, when you were saying something, uh, especially information like this, it was uh, important for him uh, to uh, uh, encase this in an oath, uh, saying uh, that this is why, he, why he's saying this. And uh, uh, he's saying, I, I, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. My conscience bearing me witness. And so, uh, strong, so strongly is Paul stirred by the self-sacrificing love of, 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 uh, of his own desire for Israel to be saved. Here, as in also in chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul uses the conscience as an independent witness within. Now think about this. When a person is saved by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit comes uh, to take up his abode uh, within our lives. Now, there's the old saying that uh, just let your conscience be your God. But that's not true because why? The conscience can be seared. The conscience can be uh, 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 numbed and, and made a void of, of no effect in our lives because of all the different things that we allow our, our minds, our bodies, our, thing, our, our lives to be involved with. But we find that uh, uh, in the Holy Spirit, when you let the Holy Spirit be your guide, then your conscience becomes very active. And not just active between right and wrong, but also active to the point of being of having wisdom and discernment and uh, 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 conscientious of the timing of God, conscientious of what would be the right thing to do, uh, uh, conscientious of being gracious instead of just being harsh with words. And uh, I think that this is a good lesson for everyone to know and understand how do you approach a, a particular situation. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a word fitly spoken it's like apples of silver in pictures of, 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 of gold, uh, or apples of gold in pictures of silver. And we find that this is so important that we understand how to say, what to say, when to say, and uh, uh, different things like this. So the Apostle Paul is, is sharing his heart, and he's saying that he has a conscience about this. He, he is a, a conscientious of what he is saying and what God is doing in people's lives. With a, a, a intensity, Paul's revealing his burden heart in verse number two. He says that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Now, there's a misconception among a Christian people that they think, well, if a person is right with God, then they're just going to be in a state of euphoria all the time. They're going to be in a state of celebration and worshipfulness and, 
and all this, and, and without uh, really having a burden. But a person that's truly serving God will indeed have a burden upon their heart as well as a, 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 a lot of thankfulness and, and worship and celebration unto the Lord. Now this is true uh, for individuals. It's also true for churches. Uh, you know, a, a good, healthy church will have a spirit of worship about it. But also a, a good, healthy church will have a burden for the laws, a burden uh, of understanding, uh, of, of balance in their lives and in their church, in their organization, about different needs that need to be addressed, different things that uh, we need to be conscientious of. And so, hence, that's the reason why. When we come to God's house, we, we have prayer time. We pray for some needs. We have a broken heart over uh, the lost and uh, pray for uh, the, the uh, situation that we find our nation in at this time. So Paul could identify uh, with these people in the fact that he himself was a persecutor of the church. He himself had been in unbelief even though he was very religious. In fact, he was religious to a fault. He was religious to the uh, place of being very zealous uh, for uh, what he thought was his religion. And he was protecting his religion uh, and by persecuting the Christians. He considered the Christian religion and the Lord Jesus Christ a threat uh, to the Jewish nation. And so he thought he was doing his patriotic duty uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, stopping the Christians. But uh, then uh, we find that after he was confronted with the light of God, and God confronted him on the road to Damascus, he realized that uh, this is a, a God that's speaking. This is the God that I've been fighting against. You see... Uh, it's a great thing when we understand what's really uh, going on in the reality of life. In John chapter 15, Jesus said these words, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, and he lay down his life for his friends. And here was Paul's self-sacrificing wish. In verse 3, he says, For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Now, the word accursed here is the word anathema, and it means condemned to utter destruction. It means dedicated to destruction and delivered <coughs> up to the judgment of God. The Apostle Paul was willing to go to hell if he could just uh, 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 save Israel, uh, save, and he knew that that was not going to be possible. But he was willing to do so. And this compassion is, is uh, uh, in, in its ultimate form, a self-sacrificing <coughs> compassion. And as he talked about his kinsmen according to the flesh, it's distinguished between his kinsmen according to the spirit, which is what he's been talking about to the Roman Christians. Also, we have to understand uh, that the, Ro uh, the Roman situation, we have to take all this in context. <laughs> Remember, the Roman church that was uh, uh, in uh, the beginning of Acts chapter 2, Many of these uh, people uh, that were saved were Jewish believers. We call them, uh, today we call them uh, Messianic Christians. They were uh, Jewish uh, believers uh, where the church started. And then as the church began to grow, it grew into uh, the Gentile believers. And the Gentile believers began to outnumber the Jewish believers because as a whole, uh, the Jewish nation had rejected uh, the Lord as their Messiah and as their Savior. So here was the dilemma, and this is why the Apostle Paul is addressing uh, this in the book of Romans. As he comes to this understanding of talking about uh, the Jewish uh, people, and he's saying that uh, my kinsmen according to the flesh, 
He says that, uh, and yet he says in, uh, the, in Exodus chapter uh, 32, in verse 32, Moses kind of said the same thing. He says in, uh, in Exodus 32, he says, Yet now, if you'll forgive their sin, but I pray, but if not, I pray that you blot me out of your book, which you have written. And so uh, Moses was interceding uh, for his people. He was heartbroken because of their unbelief. And he said, Lord, if you'll just forgive them. If not, he says, blot me out. And, and I'll just be uh, 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 numbered with them as well. And so where did Paul get such passion, such love for people? Uh, and uh, where did it come from? It was cultivated in prayer. In Romans 10 and verse 1, he says, uh, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. This was his prayer. And truly when we pray uh, for people, uh, something interesting happens in our prayer life, in our own lives. When we pray for others, what do we expect? We normally expect for God to change the other person, don't we? We're praying for that person. We want God to change that person. Or we're praying for a situation, and we want God to change that situation. But what does God do when we pray? God begins to work on us when we pray. He doesn't necessarily because of why. Because uh, on other people, every person has their own will. And that's a very simple explanation as for the unbelief of Israel. They have their own will, uh, their, their own desires, their own religion, their own uh, system. And they didn't want uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ to upset their system. That's even why they crucified him. And so it is that, uh, that uh, 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 we, we understand that people have a will. But when we pray for others, and we think, well, how come God doesn't just, just uh, do this thing? Or how come God doesn't change this or, or change that? But what God does when we pray is absolutely amazing. Because when we really get down to business and prayer about a particular situation, a particular person, God begins to change us in the process, and that is very key to understanding how God works. And that's what the Apostle Paul is revealing here as he, as he talked about his prayer uh, for these people. As, and notice, I, I, I run across an illustration that I thought would kind of help us to understand this, and this is a true story. There was a young man that was 15 years old in California. His name was uh, Philippe Garza. And Philippe uh, uh, was a healthy young man as far as I know. But he, he had a girlfriend and he loved that girl and, he, uh, and she needed a heart transplant. And he loved her so much that he, he told his mother, he says, uh, uh, if uh, something happens to me, which is an odd thing for a 15-year-old to say, because 15-year-olds are usually, uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they're indispensable. They think they're, they're indestructible, okay? But he says, if something happens to me, he says, I'll give her my heart. And so, uh, uh, oddly, uh, he actually died three weeks later of natural causes. A 15-year-old boy died of natural causes, and his heart was a perfect match for his girlfriend, and he gave her his heart. And, uh, and you think, well, that, that's a, a sacrificial thing, that he thought about that ahead of time. But notice, this is just uh, in case of his death, but here was something that went far, far beyond that. But it does illustrate uh, the heart of the, the Apostle Paul had for his people. And uh, we see his concern. And how about our concern for others that do not know Christ? Uh, the, uh, uh, are the eternally lost a priority in our lives? Are we willing to sacrifice our time, our money, 
our energy, our comfort, our safety uh, to see other people saved. And so first we learn of Paul's anguish, but the second point is found in verses 4 and 5. And that's Paul's analysis. Now Paul's analysis of this problem, that's one thing to identify a problem and to tell about your desire and what's uh, uh, going on, the realities of the situation. But here's his analysis that is very uh, instructive. In fact, in verse uh, number four, uh, there's seven different things in his analysis that are listed. It says, who, in verse four, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? That's saying a lot. So first of all, he talks about they were Israelites. They were called by the covenant name of God's chosen people. When God said, no longer are you called Jacob, you shall be called Israel, which means a prince with God. God changed his name and his he fulfilled uh, that, uh, uh, began to fulfill that uh, uh, Abrahamic promise uh, through, uh, 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 through Jacob. When he changed his name and then his 12 sons uh, would uh, become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the name indicates they were a <coughs> member of a theocracy. Israel means God's rules, ruled ones, a prince with God. And then they had uh, the adoption as sons. The children of Israel are called collectively, and this is important to note, they're called collectively the Son of God in several scriptures, but also individually they're called uh, the sons of God as well. In Hosea 1, 11 verse 1, Jeremiah 31 verse 9. And so uh, what uh, we find, the, uh, they had uh, the covenant uh, name, which is important. They were adopted as sons into God's family, into God's covenant, I should say. And then thirdly, uh, we find that they, what other people had seen, the glory or the splendor of God's divine presence. They had the presence of God when they met in the tabernacle. They knew God's presence was there. There was no question about it. It wasn't just a, a rumor. It wasn't just, well, you know, maybe God's there, maybe he's not. There was absolutely no question about the fact that God uh, met with his people and the, the Israelites uh, camped around the tabernacle on all four sides. And uh, God was in the center of that. That was by design. That wasn't by happenstance. But notice something about uh, this glory uh, that we're going to talk about here. It was the Shekinah glory of God. It was God visiting of his glory upon his people. And you've heard me mention it many times before, but the church has uh, the, the uh, glorious opportunity to reveal as being part of the body of Christ we have the opportunity to reveal something about God's glory in this community and in this land in which we live. You <coughs> think, well, uh, the, the, uh, they're just sinners. We're just all sinners, and, and we all have faults. We all have failures. We all have frailties. Uh, the, 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 you know, uh, we're very, very limited. We're, we're just a small little church in, in, a, in, a, in a, a small community. What difference does that make? Listen, if God's glory is revealed uh, to any measure at all, it is a great and glorious thing. And not for us, but for, for others to see God's glory. And it's important that we understand we have a responsibility to that. Notice how uh, that John described it. And I love the fact that John wrote everything he wrote in his old age. Amen. John wrote in John 1, verse 14, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You just can't improve on that, amen? The glory of God. And the glory refers to the Hebrew word kabod. Now you've heard the, uh, the story about Ichabod, the, the, the fact that 
uh, when uh, the glory of God departed, it was Ichabod. You know, the handwriting on the wall and, and this and the other. And, and, uh, but the, the word is Kabod. And it, it actually has to do uh, with the fact that it was the cloud over the Jews as they traveled through the wilderness by day. Kabod was, uh, and, and it, uh, it, it means, uh, it was a, a pillar of fire that went before them by night, and it was uh, the cloud by day. It was visible, tangible presence of God, the substance of, of, of God's uh, people. Notice how that it has to do with the substance of God. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for the, the note that I have here, but it has to do with the divine splendor of God, the visible glory of God. And notice how that uh, God, uh, in uh, showing forth his glory, it means the weightiness, the substance of God. Now, we tend to think of God's glory, since it's mentioned as a cloud, and many people also, in thinking spiritual terms, I think, okay, it's just some kind of, of a thing that's kind of floating around. And it is uh, uh, considered to be as a cloud in the Word of God. But think about this. The word kabod means weightiness. Now, how do you uh, associate that with a cloud? Well, I thought about it this way. There are some clouds that are just, just light and, and uh, airy and they're floating around. There's other clouds that have a lot of rain. Amen? A lot of substance, a lot of weight. There's a lot. Of, when, when the clouds come and they're, they're full of rain, you know how heavy water is. And listen, uh, that we're full of water vapor, and it's, it's uh, hanging low and uh, uh, raining down uh, uh, just uh, buckets and buckets and buckets of water. And so it is with God in his glory. It's a weighty, uh, 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 tangible thing of understanding of the uh, glory of God. And so, uh, notice then, uh, they also have the covenants. And the, the covenants are various agreements that God had made with Israel. And there was the Abrahamic covenant that you, you could spend a, a lot of time studying and understanding, but the main thing to understand about the Abrahamic covenant is the fact that God made a covenant with Abraham before any of this uh, took place. And he told Abraham, I'll make a, of you a great nation. And, and Abraham couldn't even have a child. <coughs> couldn't even have a child. And God was promising a great nation out of the loins of Abraham. And so he and Sarah got together and she said, well, I've got this handmaid over here. Her name is Hagar. Who would want to, you know, be with Hagar? <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, and I, she probably wasn't much to look at anyway, but uh, uh, he, he, made a, he made a child through Hagar because Sarah said, this is, a, this is the way we're going to do it. This is the way we're going to manipulate God's promise and make God's promise real in our lives. We're going to do this by the flesh. And he had a, a son by the flesh, and, and he wasn't a spiritual son. He wasn't an a, a, a answer to God's promise. And eventually, in their old age, they, they had Isaac. And uh, you know the story about how that all that came about. But notice the end. How that uh, uh, God had uh, promised that he would bless uh, 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 Abraham's seed. And eventually, uh, uh, as uh, Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob uh, then eventually had the sons that uh, became the 12 tribes of Israel. And God began to work through a nation, through a people. But then there was the Davidic covenant, which meant that God would uh, bless uh, the nation with a king of his choosing and that Jesus would come through the Davidic line. He would be their king eventually. And how this, this was important, but the covenants that they had. And then as, uh, as God had given these different covenants, they also had the giving of the law that's mentioned in verse 4. 
the giving of the law, the Mosaic law, provided the revelation of the will of God that exceeded anything known to the Gentiles. This was given through Israel. The Ten Commandments and all the other commandments of God. Romans uh, chapter 2 and verse 17 reveals that. The Jews rejected the will of God and they rejected it in knowledge and not in ignorance. In other words, they knew what they were doing. They knew uh, that they were uh, not following God when they rejected uh, the Messiah. The covenants and the law gave the Jews principles that they might do well, that they might uh, be uh, blessed and prosper. They had the temple worship services as well that services mentioned here. The prescriptions for divine worship, particularly outlined in, in the book of Leviticus, foreshadowed of the atoning a sacrifice of Christ. And notice, then uh, lastly, they had promises. The last thing that's mentioned in uh, uh, verse 4 of Romans 9. The promises. Now think about this. They, that encompasses all the word of God. The, it came through the uh, Jewish uh, people. Now, there were some Gentile writers. But the Jewish people had the, the word of God. They had the, the promises, the prophets. They had the, the, the great writings of David and others that steered them in the right direction. They had all these promises, and yet uh, they squandered them and rejected of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Israel then was also blessed with great men of faith. As an example is given in verse 5. Verse 5, it says, Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now, the fathers is reference to their forefathers. And that's where we can connect and understand that our forefathers in these United States, they, they weren't perfect. <coughs> And many of them you could go back and find maybe some fault here and there. But our forefathers had a, a vision. And their vision was a, a place where uh, people could come and worship in freedom. And all this talk about how the, uh, they had set it up as a secular society. No, and it wasn't freedom from religion. It was freedom of religion, by the way. And all you have to do is, is go to Washington, D.C. and read the bill. Amen. Is there any question at all about the founding fathers and the founding of our country and the direction that uh, we were in for a long time? All you have to do is just go and read the buildings, read the scripture, read the uh, inscriptions, all that, and look at the pictures, look at the uh, history of our nation, and you see the great uh, 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 scriptural and uh, spiritual founding of our nation. Notice that they too had fathers, forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and David, and all the rest that followed uh, through that. Then comes the culmination, the blessing, a blessing that's given in, uh, in this verse, from whom Christ came. The Messiah, the anointed of God, came uh, through uh, the Jewish uh, people. His father, his mother, was of Jewish descent, of of David's lineage. And we find that uh, he grew up in a Jewish home. He went to a Jewish school. He sat in a Jewish synagogue. He ministered uh, to the Jewish people. He says in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, I have come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What was an unspeakable gift was given to the Jews as their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they rejected him. It was a great grief in the life of the Apostle Paul. This was a sorrow that he had. But notice how that as, as he talked about how that they had rejected him, he says, but who is over all, a clear statement of the deity of Christ. And it talked about, uh, it, it, it followed the remark about his, his humanity. It says, according to the flesh, God is still over all. He's blessed. He's an understood of the, the Messiah. You know, our Sunday school class this morning was, we were talking, we, we landed on the baptism 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a marvelous thing. When the Lord was baptized in the River Jordan, he was baptized and he mentioned it about to fulfill all righteousness. What God was doing was identifying with the message that John was preaching. And it was to uh, connect with God's people, with God's message, with what the Lord was doing. And it was in that way, it was fulfilling all righteousness. It was connecting all the dots. And this is what they failed to do. Israel failed to connect the dots. They connect, failed uh, to see how that the Lord was the Messiah. Now, the wise men were wise. Okay? Because why? Uh, they knew, uh, they looked in the scriptures, they said, well, uh, the, the, the uh, Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And they saw the star in the east, and they followed that star, and they said, hey, uh, this is all the dots are connecting here. There's something uh, that God, and that's what God wants us to do as we look into the word of God. He wants us to connect all the dots. But listen, here's the key. He wants us not only to connect the dots in knowledge and understanding, <clears throat> but he wants to connect the dots in our lives. He wants to make connection with us personally. And once we do that, uh, then God is able to uh, use us, to speak to us, to help us along the way. We're not on this journey by ourselves. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He, he gives us the Scripture. He gives us all that we need. He gives us the grace that we need every step that we take. He's with us all the way. He doesn't just shove us out the door and say, okay, I saved you. I, I've uh, given you some things. Now you just do the best what you can with what you've got. No, he tells us and leads us. He's our shepherd every single day. Every moment of every day, he's there with us to help us, to, uh, to guide us, as he was with Israel, but they rejected him. And we have that uh, uh, um, opportunity in our lives. We can accept the Lord and we can reject Him. We can follow Him or we can choose not to follow Him. We have the choice to make in our own lives. Would you stand with us this morning? With our heads bowed, our Father, we, we ask the Lord that in all things we would listen to the Holy Spirit that we would pay attention to Lord what you have done in the past in bringing us to this point. And Lord, that we might connect the dots in our lives, that we might allow the Holy Spirit to make connection with all these things and bring us to a place, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, a place of repentance, a place of where we're saying we can no longer go the direction that we're going. We must turn around and follow you. Lord, help us to do that. Lord, not only as individuals, help us to do that as a, as, as a, as a church, as a group of people to follow you fully. And then, Lord, help us to have an influence in this nation that's going the wrong direction. We might look at it as hopeless and helpless, but, Lord, we can have an influence on at least some. We can have an influence in our community. We can have an influence in our prayer life. We can have an influence in our families. Help us, Lord, to do that this morning. By your grace, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. What number? 130.